computer, not the cloud. Audhu billahi min ash-shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I begin, as I always begin, in the name of Allah, whose grace I seek in this and all other matters. Um, uh, Farah, you might want to mute your uh, sound. Just thank you. Um, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce uh, Imam Musin Hendricks. Um, Musin Hendricks is an Islamic scholar with a background in classical Arabic and Islamic sciences uh, obtained at the University of Islamic Studies, Jamia Darussat al Islamiya, from Karachi, Pakistan. Mohsen is an imam, a religious leader by profession, and also a human rights activist focusing on sexual orientation and gender identity in Islam. He has done independent research on Islam and sexual diversities, an area that does not often get explored in the Muslim world. He has delivered many training modules on the subject to various organizations internationally. He also holds a diploma in counseling and he uses his Islamic training in conjunction with his counseling and coaching to bring healing to queer Muslims. He is the founder of uh, Al Qurba Foundation in Cape Town and the administrator of the, a, of the Compassion Centered Islam Network, CCI Network. His publications include a policy brief on Islam, sexuality, and access to health, Islamic texts, a source of acceptance for queer individuals into mainstream Muslim society, Islam and sexual diversity, interrogating heteropatriarchy and Islamic texts. I love that title. Currently, he's working on his book, From Extremist Exclusion to Radical Inclusion, uh, per usual, uh, Imam Muslim will speak to us about his journey for about 15 minutes. I'm not going to time you, so the, you know, however long you want. <laughs> and then I will um, say something about uh, my journey with him and uh, our friendship and uh, ask a question before opening up to the gallery. So Imam Muslim, you have the floor. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. And uh, first of all, thanks to um, my sister Amina Wadud uh, for inviting me as, as one of her guests. I feel truly honored and I couldn't say no. And I have to also commend you on your beautiful background. I want one of those. <laughs> Great. So, I'll be the Shaitan al Rajim. Bismillah rahman rahim. So, um, I've, I've probably told my story a hundred times and every time I finish my story, I'm like, you know, I should have said that and, and I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so what I've done this time around, I actually just set out down uh, a couple of points. Uh, if you don't mind, I would, I would read the story a little bit and I respond better to questions because if sometimes I forget something, um, you will remind me and I will be happy to answer that question for you. So, um, feeling rejected uh, for being different has always been a theme in my life. And ever since I was a child, um, I was an effeminate boy and I was shunned for it, uh, but I was also left-handed. And growing up in my community, you had to eat with your right hand. And I can remember stories about my grandfather because he was the imam at our mosque he used to tie my left hand behind my back so that I'm forced to eat with my right hand. And today still, if, if I'm driving and somebody says turn left, I first go like, which one is left? <laughs> so that's the kind of damage that it, that it caused. But more than that, it was the rejection that I have experienced. Um, and so my story of rejection and seeking love and acceptance for who I am goes back many years. I was born in a very conservative Muslim community and a, Muslim, a conservative Muslim family. My grandfather was the Imam of our mosque, which was like a stone's throw away from our house. And my mother was a teacher in this mosque. And so at the time when I came into this world, that was all I knew was Islam. My father was also a spiritual healer. And so when you were jinxed, you know, you go to uh, Butashaki and he will, he will sort you out. You know. So, and because of all this religiosity, my perception of Allah was also shaped at a very early age. 
I always imagine Allah to be this man, uh, you know, sitting on a chair and he used to wear one of these green cloaks that used to hang in the mosque behind the door. And uh, he used to have this pointy black piece of hair sticking out on, on, you know, between his eyebrows. And so it wasn't a good perception of, of Allah. And I think the perception was shaped by how, how stern my grandfather used to be. And uh, this man on this chair was always ready to punish for anything that you, that you were about to do wrong. So, um, so my perception of Allah was one of fear. And it was only when I came to discover a different Allah, it was, I was in my 20s, when I began to disconnect from my early teachings about Islam that was no longer resonating with me. Um, most of my understanding of Islam and Allah was shaped by my grandfather's serious demeanor and his rigorous teachings of Islam. So I could not imagine coming out as a queer person in such an ultra-Orthodox uh, Muslim environment. And uh, ever since I knew that I was different from other boys, I was, I was hiding my true self, pretending to be one, you know, amongst the male crowd. Um, even though this has given me endless pain you know, because of all the, the, the teasing and the scoffing that happened uh, because I was effeminate. And so from a very early age, I would feel this rejection um, for who I'm being. And, and that just drove me even further into the closet. So I think I lost a, a significant part of my youth because of being in the closet. And one thing that, was, that always confused me was when I heard mixed messages coming from the masjid, from the pulpit, and messages that were saying that Allah is the most compassionate, the most merciful, the most forgiving. Uh, but yet, I don't see this compassion or, and inclusiveness within my community. And so that always used to confuse me. Until I decided one day that I wanted to study uh, Islam for myself and I wanted to understand this Allah much better. Because at that point I was only knowing Allah through the lens of my own childhood ex experience. So I was 21 when I responded to a, an ad that was placed by the Call of Islam, an organization that was very active during the time of apartheid. And they wanted to send six students away to study in Pakistan and I applied and Alhamdulillah, I got selected. And so from 1990 to 1994, I was enrolled at Jamia Dirasat al-Islamiyah in Karachi where I studied Arabic, Tafsir al-Quran, Mustalah al-Hadith and many other subjects. And I was grateful for the opportunity, but little did I know that I was also enrolled into a Salafi school, you know, another strict uh, Islamic ideology that I needed to sort of unlearn uh, in later years. But I was grateful for the opportunity to have learned Arabic um, because I could then start my own engagement with the Quran, and do my own research and my own questioning that I couldn't find satisfaction for in my community. I could find it directly in the Quran. And it was also a start of a love-hate relationship with Allah because whenever I came across a Quranic ayat that I was I was just uncomfortable with and it didn't resonate with me. There was this wrestling going on between me and Allah. Until a point where I came to realize that um, it was only my own limitations of, of, of understanding and looking at life and my own uh, challenges through my own limitations. And uh, because the Quran was truly speaking to every part of my life at that time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just... So, one of the things that stood out for me uh, at the time when I was wrestling with Allah is, I mean, I, I looked at Quran and I looked at Hadith and I, there was one Hadith that was very beautifully just summing it up for me, my relationship that I have then established with Allah, moving away from organized religion. And the hadith is recorded in Bukhari and it says, um, 
I am to my servant as my servant sees me. وَأَنَا مَعَهُ إِذَا ذَكَرَنِي And I am with, with them whenever they remember me. Uh, فَإِنْ ذَكَرَنِي فِي نَفْسِي ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي نَفْسِي then, And if my servant mentions me in solitude, I mention him in solitude. وَإِنْ ذَكَرَنِي فِي مَلَئٍ ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي مَلَئٍ خَيْرٌ مِّنْهُمْ And if they remember me in a congregation, I remember them in a congregation even better than that. And this was just the start of a pretty personal journey with, with Allah uh, to an extent where I had to have a lot of courage to actually um, leave behind some of the things that were, were no longer resonating with me uh, that I was brought up to believe uh, that, is, that, that is Islam. Um, so my need for authenticity at that time was greater than, than you know, the need to, um, I could say even the need to love. Because for me at the time when I came out, I said that I would, I would either want, I would rather want to meet my creator knowing that I was authentic with who I was, than to have to answer why I lived a double, a double life. And so, if I can just jump back to the time when I decided to get married, because that was also a very difficult period in my life. It was when I was 23 years old, I decided to, to try and um, live up to the ideals of my family and my, my community. And, and I often heard my mother saying that you can't study to be an imam if you're not following the sunnah of the prophet, which is to get married. So I did that. I was married for six years, but already in my first year, I knew that I have made a big mistake. And I felt very guilty because although, although my wife at the time before we got married, she knew that I was gay because I told her, I don't think she knew the depth of what she was getting herself into because she thought it was something that was going to uh, blow over. So I felt very guilty that I have drawn an innocent woman into my uh, problem. Um, and I was not able to, to have sexual relationships with her. In the beginning, I really tried. I, I think I uh, probably succeeded three times and that's why I have three kids um, from that relationship. <laughs> but that's probably how far, as far as it goes. <laughs> So, um, but then slowly, slowly, I felt that uh, this was not fair, um, partly because I also then, by no design of my own, fell in love with one of my best friends in Pakistan. And here I am caught up in this relationship, but in love with somebody else. So the relationship only lasted for six months, uh, I mean, for six years. And then we, after my studies, uh, it was probably, the end of the first year that we decided that we were going to get divorced. And then from there, I just gave her everything and I, because I was worried about the kids that they should be, you know, they should not suffer. And I went uh, to live on a farm with a friend of mine and uh, this friend said to me, look, I don't have a place for you, but one of our horses died. If you want to clean out the stable, you can use it as a room. So I lived in there for three months and I vowed that I was going to continue to fast until Allah gives me uh, a clear sign as to from that point onwards, what is it that I'm supposed to do with my life? And I can tell you this much that the, that hijra moment for me, that moving away from society, um, finding your own truth uh, was a really, uh, was a milestone in my in my journey, and uh, I fasted for about eighty days. And towards the end of that seclusion period, I felt very. I, I mean, I can't say that it was dreams and wahi that I was getting or anything like that. It was just this overwhelming sense that I'm okay with who I am now. And it was on this eightieth day that I went to the. To the media and I invited them and I said, look, 
I would like to share my story with you. I'm coming out. I don't care whether I'm going to be dying, but I just feel this compelling need to be authentic with who I am. Story was front page uh, on, in the newspaper. That was on the Monday. And then I was pulled into the classroom on Monday because I was teaching at Claremont Maynard Mosque at that time. And um, I, was, I was asked, uh, why didn't you tell us that you were gay? And I said, well, none of you told me that you were straight. I didn't think I owed it to you to tell you that. <laughs> and they said, well, you're going to have to, you're going to have to leave because, because parents will be taking their children out of school and it's not safe and, you know, a long story. And I said, look, I'm happy to leave. But I was very sad because I loved my teaching position that I had. And that was really the start of my activism because from that point onwards, um, a lot of queer Muslims contacted me. Uh, they wanted to know how I can help them. And every time when I met with queer Muslims, I was, I was, I was present to how they negotiate this dilemma between their sexual orientation and gender and, and Islam, and gender identity and Islam. And it was either drug taking, it was abuse of alcohol, it was just, you know, reckless and irresponsible sexual behavior. And it was also people saying, look, I'm only Muslim in name, uh, you know, for the sake of my family, but I've actually left Islam. And I left Islam before it was going to reject me. And uh, actual five cases of suicide um, that I, uh, I was recording at the time. So I felt compelled that, that perhaps this is what Allah wants me to do, is to help others to, to not go through the same experiences. Um, and fortunately, alhamdulillah, I had the knowledge. So whenever somebody came to me and said, um, but Allah says this in the Quran, and I said, no, but this is not what Allah says in the Quran. And, um, and I remember that in 1998, I was uh, contacted by Atlantic Philanthropies here in, in uh, Johannesburg. And they said, look, we saw you, but the work that you do, would you like us to help you to formalize that? And I was completely naive, had no idea of how to be an executive director of an organization, but I knew something had to be done. Uh, so I learned by trial and error. But alhamdulillah, I uh, established an organization and um, up till today, I, I still help people. Um, and my story that I've just told you now also gives people a lot of strength, um, knowing that this is possible, that one can be queer and Muslim. So I'm going to leave it at that. And then you're welcome to ask uh, any questions for clarity. Wow, thank you so much. Um, there are a few aspects of the story that are actually uh, new to me, um, which I really okay. appreciate your sharing. Um, and uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about... Was it um, huh? Sorry? <laughs> was it the sex part with my wife? <laughs> no, it was the, uh, the horse uh, stable. <laughs> okay. Staying in Khalwa, in the horse stable and, you know, 80, day, 80 days fasting, you know, uh, that's, uh, it's a very deep kind of, you know, purification experience because you, you disconnect yourself, you know, from everything that you know uh, in order to know, you know, so it's a, it's a really deep Khalwa, you know. Um, I uh, also... Um, there was one other thing uh, I'm a little distracted because I wanted to say something about when we met uh, and uh, our experiences together um, because uh, Mostan is like my my brother from another mother. First of all, um, uh, when we met, my last name was Mostan because <laughs> I had married a man who's last name was Mohsen. <laughs> so we were already, you know, star-crossed. And uh, we met at a queer retreat in um, Georgia, I think it was, that was led by uh, Faisal. Yeah. Um, it was yes, my yes. first, it was my first uh, queer retreat. Um, I had been working 
um, in some small way to uh, be, and you know, at the time I identified as an outward ally. I have a different identity now, which I'm going to share because of, it, it is actually because of work with uh, Mohsen. Uh, when um, <clears throat> you started holding air before the name, and then you know after the name, and then when the name changed, because I love change. Uh, when you started uh, the air, I just couldn't get my schedule free for the first few invitations. I remember that, you know. Uh, and finally, when it happened, you know, then after that, it was like you know I was free, you know, consecutively to as many times as I was invited to attend. And really, it was air. Uh, and the way in which you orchestrated it, you know, and your personality, you know, and your dedication and your humility and your hard work and your care for people that really turned me around, even in my location. Because my location, um, I started out as a um, in the closet ally. Uh, people mm -hmm. who, um, I, I find that working in the sort of, sort of uh, predominantly uh, heteronormative women's movement, <clears throat> there are still a lot of uh, people who resist the necessity of the intersection and inclusion of sexuality in any uh, discussion or activity regarding gender. Um, and they give good reasons for it. Um, and yet for me, I find uh, that I don't have the patience for those reasons because I'm a black woman from the United States. I'm predominantly hijabi in public in an Islamophobic, you know, uh, reality. Uh, and um, I, uh, I, don't, I don't see this idea that somehow exercising any kind of privilege um, is, is ethically acceptable. Um, so I, I, I have to be patient with people because people are working according to their capacity, but it's not a location that I can hold anymore. Having gone through those phases myself, I also would like to be a part of the solution. In other words, I'd like to make contributions that would help people to um, at first engage at least intellectually about the necessity of the intersection. And then hopefully in terms of more uh, activism and, and, and then, you know, also eventually spirituality. But from the very first air, this spirituality was the most moving part of it. And it made it easy for me to understand that um, this is where I want to be. This is not a separation. I'm not reinventing the wheel or you know, making a new Islam or anything like that. I'm simply uh, extending, you know, including, we say, inclusive. I am simply extending that which I know and understand about Islam, that which I know and love about Allah. I'm extending that to people who have been told point blank that they cannot be within Islam and within their own, you know, gendered bodies. Um, and I found that location, the exclusion that, you know, rejects people for their sexual diversity, I find that abhorrent. Mm -hmm. and, and yet you cannot work out of the anger and frustration. I mean, you can, and you can even get some things done. Uh, but if you really want to go the long haul, um, you really have to tap into the love and compassion. And it was mm -hmm. so easy when we you know, when we went to these retreats because uh, it was built around the nurturing of the spiritual well-being of the participants. So therefore, as a participant, mm -hmm. I also received that spiritual well-being, even if I was asked to do some simple task, you know, which I tried to perform, at least I hope most of the ones I was asked to do. Uh, but uh, it was that nurturing environment. And within, when I remember when air was really small, and one of the ones that I went to, they had a session on um, people, you know, just sort of self-reflection, muhasiba, self-reflecting to understand what is their own sexuality. Um, and um, it really helped me to understand my own 
queer identity because um, I have spent more years of my life celibate than I would care mm. to identify. So I consider myself to be uh, an involuntarily celibate gender non-binary. And the, the gender non-binary is because if you listen to Imam Muslim's voice and you listen to my voice, my voice is deeper than his. <laughs> <laughs> and I use, I use the voice because it's subtle and it's usually not charged to indicate mm -hmm. that I experience gender on a spectrum and that within myself, I uh, need to, you know, it's what I call sort of the Tawhidic balance between my masculine and my feminine. And the extent to which one of them overpowers the other uh, without the acceptance of, you know, the extension, you know, of that other is the extent to which I would be off balance. Um, and only by accepting uh, non-binary as my identity am I able to be at peace with myself, to be at one with my creator, and through that at one bit to be uh, an agent, a khalifa of Allah on the earth. All of this Absolutely. is a result of uh, participating in these settings that prioritized um, yes. Allah and faith uh, and compassion and love uh, through all the tumultuous things that happen. Uh, one year I came, for example, and I don't know why it was that particular year that everybody thought that they should come to me for deep private consultation. <laughs> and I don't have right. any training in that, but I, I am a mother and a grandmother. I don't have any training in it. And so when people are at a deep level, what happens to me is that it really tears at my heart. And uh, people would approach me and I would be present for them. You know, they'd be crying and they, you know, they would go through different things. And they tell, you know, horrible things that people have experienced, as you know. Um, and I would be a witness, you know, I would be patient with the story, but then I'd have to go to my room because I had to regroup. And I remember going to him and I said, please, we'll sit. they're just, they're coming to me and you know, I'm not trained, you know? Uh, and uh, he said, we have people. <laughs> oh good because <laughs> I felt like you know is this what I'm called to do but I'm not really competent you know so over the years uh, the variance uh, of the uh, effort to to bring uh, Muslims together with acceptance of a spectrum that so therefore it doesn't just include queer it also includes you know heteronormative Muslims which is you know, also a very powerful thing that happens there in South Africa, that you, you know, you have people who are participating and it's not just, you know, like a gay bar in the mosque setting kind of thing. It is, it is how do we achieve uh, our best Islam through the bodies that we are embodied in? Um, so mm -hmm. I owe a lot to you um, I owe, in, in some ways, I consider that m my Islam was saved by my encounters with and then my eventual integration in the queer Muslim community, because exactly what you said earlier, how difficult it is to live a lie and at the same time wish to have an authentic and honest relationship with Allah. And it was for me only in the settings, you know, with queer Muslims that I could let down, you know, my hair or whatever. I could let loose to the layers of facade that was necessary in order to be able to interact in other parts of the Muslim community that was more conservative and that, you know, had, you know, very narrow and strict uh, articulations of what was, you know, acceptable. I didn't accept what they found acceptable. So how am I going to at one time love my identity as a Muslim and therefore by extension my community uh, if uh, I'm not really resonating with how the community is projecting, you know, what it is that, you know, is supposed to be Islam. So for me, the last, you know, 15, 20 years or so, um, the queer Muslim community has been my home. 
um, without any, uh, there's no quibbling. It's the place where mm -hmm. I feel the most connected mm -hmm. to Allah, with the exception of when I am alone, because I'm a very chalwa yeah. person. Uh, it's the place where I feel the most connected. It's the place where I feel the most authentic. And mm -hmm. were it not for your spiritual orientation with regard to it, which I didn't experience every time there was a queer Muslim, you know, event. Sometimes they were just, you know, social events and people were sort of coincidentally Muslim and, you know, I mean, it's not a bad setting, but the settings have an intention to nurture the deepest part uh, of those mm -hmm. who are in participation. And I have mm -hmm. always had so much great admiration for you in, in, in being able to pull that off. Uh, and mm -hmm. I wanted to let you know that it has been a very powerful uh, influence in my life and has made you know the, the last 15, 20 years of my life way more uh, entrenched in my faith, way more mm -hmm. confident and comfortable to be in my skin as a Muslim so I owe so much to you, uh, you know, in that respect. I just wanted Thank to. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I want Thank to. You. And I, I, I always also look up to you. I mean, it's, you're one of my icons in this world. And, you know, when, when, you know, sometimes when I'm confused about something and I listen to you and I was like, yeah, that's it. You know, I mean, I just said it and I'm going to copy that and I'm going to use it actually. So you've also been a lot, you know, you've given me a lot of strength on my journey as well. So I also have to thank you for that. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So I'm going to, and I, uh, I just, go I, ahead. I, yeah, I just, want, I just wanted to add because you made a very valid point and I, I, I'm, Yuna also just confirmed what I have uh, uh, seen in these 15 interviews that I did with queer Muslims uh, for, my, for my book that I'm currently writing. It's this whole, this whole journey away from organized faith or organized religion as if that is standing in our way of being connected with Allah. And our personal journey um, has to speak higher than that. Why I'm saying that is because, um, you know, what is my point that I was trying to make now? I just lost it. <laughs> um, and the, the difference the, between- my, the sexual, my sexual orientation, the, my sexual orientation, and, and for many queer Muslims that I've, uh, I've interviewed, has only been the impetus to this deeper and personalized relationship with Allah. And I don't think if, if, I, if I did not go through that experience that I would have had this relationship with Allah clearly. So, so and at the end of the day, and I mean, I teach this in my, in my courses as well, I say, always say that we are spiritual beings here having a physical experience and our primary identity is our spiritual identity. And you know these other identities, they they bodily identities, and and they can't, they they just there to help us move into that you know direction of spirituality. Um, but but it's not that that should not define us. So I can comfortably say today that I I don't I don't need those labels. I use them for political reasons, yeah. but other than that, I'm just a Muslim. Yeah, yeah, and I think. Uh, the, the, the experience, you know, that I used to have before I accepted my own identity, I think in full, uh, was mm -hmm. to be in the presence of people who were struggling with their authentic expression of their spirituality. Um, right. Because it's so easy to take, you know, sort of the organized, neoconservative, you know, patriarchal, uh, articulation of Islam as if it is the only Islam or the right. real or the true. And when you see it expressed, you realize, well, that's not true for me. So maybe it's, right. maybe I'm not really Muslim. Uh, and uh, right. when I first used to talk, you know, ab about gender, I used to say, you know, we come into the community and they tell you that a good Muslim woman is a, B, C. Uh, and you look at yourself and you say, oh my goodness, I am A, B, R, or I am A, C, X. 
So you try to twist yourself like a pretzel so you can be A, B, C, uh, and you deny your R and, and your, you know, X. And I said, well, what about if a good Muslim woman is A through Z and you get to be who you are? You know, I mean, so it was just like sort of a simplification of the embracing of the fullness of yourself as part of your journey. Mm -hmm. And for me in my life, and you know, I've, I'm, I'm uh, planning to celebrate, inshallah, 50 years as a Muslim, as an adult, and as an activist, you know, and a seeker uh, in, in two more years, uh, because it's an interesting milestone, because I was not born Muslim, but at least yeah. as I entered into Islam, I gave it my all. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, along that journey, uh, this realization that you, um, you have to shed all your layers. You have to go into the, the horse stall, you know, and remove your food uh, so that yeah. you can come face to face with yourself. Because as the Sufis say, you know, would you know Allah? You have to know yourself first. You know, uh, but I, 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 I found the affirmation of that more in the queer Muslim context. Um, and that really heartens me because now, as I say, that's my context. And that's just the way that I, that's the way that I roll. You know, I'm not even, I'm not even going to be anything else. You know, um, yeah. I'm going to ask the question. And then uh, it, we will open up to the gallery uh, for questions. Either you can put them in the chat, I will review them, or you can uh, speak, just uh, raise your hand or some way indicate. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, um, uh, how do you approach uh, the reality of uh, what I would call integrity of human relations vis-a-vis -vis sexual intimacy when you are, um, you know, in advocacy and leadership and counseling in your community. So for example, so that's the abstract part, so let's make it more clear. So for example, you know, you try to express to people when we come to these retreats that they, this is, the, this is a place where they should observe a certain level of sexual decorum. Um, and I uh, struggle with how to articulate this when the only articulation of it that I know comes from a very rigid definition of Zina uh, for which, uh, you know, um, there is no alternative uh, today uh, except for a heteronormative formal ceremony of Nikah. Uh, there is no, you know, so, um, you know, the, the idea of performing marriages for uh, same-sex couples and trans, uh, you know, couples and intersex persons in, you know, whatever their location is, has become a part of, you know, your, uh, your um, agency in the community. But um, I wanted to know how you see, I feel like in some ways, I don't want to be hypocritical as an involuntarily celibate person for more years than anything else in my life. I don't want to be self-righteous about it because I did have two of those supposedly halal marriages. Um, I don't want to be self-righteous about it when I am speaking with others. And yet at the same time, I do feel that there is something about the integrity of self that is necessary in intimate relationships with an other and that that integrity, uh, you know, is, is what will bring you both together closer to your true self, you know, and to Allah. But I know that uh, yes. sometimes queer Muslims uh, in trying to even understand their sexuality end up in all other kinds of places. Um, and I don't want yes. to judge those places. Uh, but at the same time, as I said, I'd like to advocate for uh, sort of the the mutual integrity. So I wanted to know how you came to, you know, to understand that for yourself, and then in terms of how you advocated in the community. Right. So I I do think that uh, the Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam probably understood 
uh, more than any other prophet that uh, sexuality is part of our hierarchy of needs. And uh, to me, he comes across as one of the most uh, sex positive uh, prophets that I've ever come across. And uh, so, so one can't deny people the, the, the opportunity to express themselves uh, sexually. Um, but I, I, I noticed from a Quranic perspective that there's, there's always this regulation of, um, or there's, there's, there's always this need to, to regulate the person, not so much so that there's the do's and the do's and the harams and the halals, whatever, but to pre preserve the, the, the integrity of the soul. And so this is what I also then promote. Um, and, and, and while promoting that, I had to really look at the institution of marriage within Islam and had to come to conclude that this was a seven to nine century construction of what, of what um, you know, that verse in the Quran that says, um, uh, uh, that Allah has created partners for you. And the whole idea of the partnership is is to create love and mercy between two people, not between husband and wife, but between two people. So then the idea of an intimate relationship would have to have that ingredient that there is, there, there, there is connection between people, there's mercy that is, uh, you know, engendered between two people and love. And, and according to um, Imam Hanafi, he says that um, there is only one principle of marriage, that is the ijab and the kabul. One person uh, requests and the other person accepts. And so that is a point of consent, right? So the primary, the primary uh, ingredient of a marriage or the principle of a marriage would have to be consent. Right? So I'm not very strict about that people have to be married in, before they can have sex. I have many couples who have lived together for quite a long time. There is complete agreement between them. There is this principle of kafa in Arabic, which is compatibility. Even though they're from different faith, there is huge respect for each other's beliefs and so on. And within that kind of a setup, there's the possibility of that mawaddat and, and rahma to happen. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a bit liberal in that sense that I, I, I don't insist that one has to go through this institution of marriage that was handed down to us, but that those principles of the marriage or the, or the, 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 uh, the contract needs to be in place. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I always say we adjudicate it uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the heteronormative uh, patriarchal marriage. We adjudicated uh, we didn't adjudicate we could have chosen that as the basis. So I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, okay, so I have a question. Um, and uh, could you say a little bit about uh, what grassroots strategies you have found useful in engaging with the wider community in promoting a more inclusive understanding of diverse sexualities and gender identities, both in mm -hmm. countries like South Africa, where the constitution offers protection, as well as those countries in which such protection uh, does not exist? Right. I'm not sure if you're looking for personal strategies or sort of more political strategies. I don't have many of those. I sort of just, you know, feel my way through things. But I, I, I think certain things that have sort of kept me safe while I'm doing my activism is are, are very spiritual uh, teachings. Uh, you know, for example, I, I don't believe that I'm here to change anybody. I'm just here because I have an experience and I want to share that experience with people. And I always say that when people ask me, so you're sort of the most out queer imam in the world, and, but how come there's not been any threat to your life? And uh, touch wood, alhamdulillah, I've not had a single threat in my life. And it's because I don't, I don't make people wrong. I don't say that they have a wrong concept of you know, what, what Islam and homosexuality is all about. But here's my story and here's my 18 years of research. And so, you know, 
take that. And um, I mean, what Amina has so beautifully explained was the, my idea with, with the retreat was to nurture souls and to meet those souls at the places where they are at, whatever it looks like, you know, for them. There's no judgment. It's just providing a space for people to nurture their primary identity, which is their spiritual identity. And, um, and, and, and then faith, you know, just, I think when you've, when you, you know, they, they, they say in Arabic that, um, uh, you know, once you've tasted halawat al-iman, the sweetness of iman, there's no turning back. So for me, you cannot taste sweetness of iman unless you are authentic, right? Because authentic in Arabic is, um, Hakikiya, and that is the that is the second uh, the third level of 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 spirituality, and so um, so when you when you're on this path of authenticity, you absolutely have to trust that whatever you do, whatever risks you take, there is support for you on the other side. Thank you for that. And also the questioner uh, says, thank you. Uh, any more questions from the gallery? Cause I have a few more things I can add. Uh, let me just check and see if my <clears throat> bifocals are letting me see. Okay. All right. So um, let me just uh, go forward with uh, something that I've been thinking about uh, and ask uh, your uh, ideas about it. Um, I've decided that, um, you know, the, the next journey for me uh, in this quest for uh, inclusive Islam <clears throat> is the one where I advocate that um, for everyone who says um, that Islam is universal, that it's for all places, all times, and all people, um, and then with the same mouth, um, they say you can't be gay and Muslim. Uh, I've decided that I'm going to be working under a rubric of uh, the queer Muslim reality uh, as the challenge of universality of Islam. And that, uh, you know, you cannot express all places, all people, and all uh, times um, as a, a quasi-statement of diversity uh, without the uh, explicit embrace of sexual diversity as one of the aspects of diversity in the human uh, community. Uh, I like this. Um, I like this because um, uh, in my journey before I, you know, was you know, granted the opportunity to do some more in-depth research um, uh, and had just skimmed the surface of what was there and, you know, didn't look in all of different uh, resources and sources, you know, across our intellectual tradition. Um, before that time, I, I actually had some doubts. Uh, in other words, the mainstream discourse had impacted me, uh, especially in conversation with uh, the way in which people treat certain portions of the discourse about uh, profit loot. Uh, and so if you focus on those, uh, you know, disconnected, uh, you know, portions, uh, it, it's possible to get a very negative impression of things. Uh, and so I had to reconnect those portions with everything that was discussed. So just do a typology of everything. Um, and that helped me to get a grip on, oh, okay, so what happens is it's just like, you know, when, when I did work on gender and after I finished what I thought was an elegant presentation about, you know, why women and men are equal, uh, somebody in the audience says, but does it take two female witnesses for one man? And I'm like, somehow when people try to reduce uh, the equality to a numeric you know, or quantitative value, somehow those two things, that and the inheritance, somehow those things cancel out the notion of equality that I'm trying to promote. Because when they're asking the question, they're not asking the question because they want to enhance my knowledge. They're asking the question because they want to take me down a peg with regard to the presumed uh, and therefore dominant notion of, of hierarchy. Well, we know this is how people use the, the, the portion of the loot discourse um, they don't use it 
uh, in the comprehensive, complex, and ambiguous, which is my new favorite word, the ambiguous way in which it really exists. Uh, so I was interested in uh, how this ethical articulation, you know, that the, the challenge is for Islam to embrace its own expression of universality by the way in which the, the queer Muslim uh, community uh, becomes, you know, included and mainstreamed and, you know, and the like. What do you think about that? Right. No, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm completely with you on that one. I, um, I think one of the reasons why we call ourselves al Ghuraba because al Ghurba refers to the strangers and it comes from this uh, hadith where the Prophet said Bada al-Islamu gharibhan wa sayaudu gharibhan kama bada fatuba lil ghuraba and so Islam started out as a strange thing and it will return as a strange thing so give glad tidings to the strangers and so in order to figure out who the strangers were you would have to go back to see how Islam really started in the beginning and we see that if it's, if it's people like Khadija and if it's youth and if it's people that, you know, were living on the peripheries of society that first embraced Islam before it were these statesmen, then, um, then Islam will really be resurfacing, you know, amongst the most marginalized of communities. And who are the most marginalized of communities at the moment? It's women and queer people, right? So that's the new flavor of Islam. And uh, therefore, I don't think we should make small of the, the, uh, the, the narratives of queer people, because within those narratives, there's a lot of answers for what is the direction we would need to take in order to resurface that Islam. Yeah, so I'm completely with you on that one. And on the loot thing, I just wanted to add that um, there's about 96 verses on Komul Lut, right? Spread over 10 different chapters. And, and there's only three of those verses that talks about male to male sex. But I don't know how, for what reason, suddenly this whole story is about <laughs> sex. And, and what is also beautiful is that when you, when you sort of puzzle those pieces together, those ayats together, it concludes with a beautiful uh, ayat that says, um, and in the story, there is a sign for, the, for, 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 for those who reflect um, but yet most of humanity know this not. But Allah is the most, uh, most powerful and the most merciful. Often we neglect those, those finishing lines in the Quran, you know, because the story was about the abuse of power. That's why Allah had to remind us that I am the most powerful, right? And so, so then, then the sexual activities that happened was related to power. It wasn't related to sexual orientation and gender identity. And then another fact is that um, there's Madani surahs and there's Makhi surahs, right? And all of these verses about Komulut appears in Makhi surahs. And Makhi surahs does not deal with sexual orientation. It deals with purity of belief. It deals with, with stories of old, you know, so that we don't repeat the same mistakes and so on. Where is the connection to sexual orientation and gender identity? And that's what we also need to, to start promoting. Yeah, and uh, I like to point out that uh, actually the uh, Imra'atul Lut is castigated five times in those, you know, 96 to 100 uh, passages. In other words, she is castigated more than any comments about male to male sex, and yet right. she obviously could not be a participant in male to male sex. So, absolutely, right? absolutely. <laughs> but I, al I also say that. Uh, She's, she's, she's an icon of unfaithfulness. It's not because she's a woman. <laughs> it was, it, the, the whole idea of the story is to point out that, you know, be careful also because not all your partners are faithful to you. <laughs> but we, we, we take it out that no, she was a woman, that's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm going to keep on uh, operating under why it is also necessary to embrace ambiguity um, because in the liminal spaces um, is where transformations often occur. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. the idea that you can always pin down things, you know, how do you, how do you catch a wave and pin it down? 
the idea that you can always pin down things with regard to the sublime, the ultimate Allah, uh, means mm -hmm. that you cannot receive uh, from the breadth of the reality which is Allah because you have decided mm -hmm. that everything is going to simply be, you know, uh, quantifiable or, you know, categorized in clear halal haram kinds of ways. And, and actually it's much broader than that. And it's that full spectrum. You know, we, we are spiritual beings having a physical existence. Um, if we want to tap into that spirit, we have to understand that it is not encapsulated solely in our physicalities and our physicalities is a vehicle through which we hopefully will be able to embrace the total. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we learn more and more the more we surrender, I think, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, we are um, at the total of our hour. Um, it's a nice thing because it does go very fast. Um, and I yeah. love you uh, dearly. I am so grateful that Allah chose uh, you to live during the time when I could know you and love you. Um, I am in such awe and admiration for your work and your stamina uh, and your love and your light. Mm -hmm. Keep up the good work. We're waiting for the corona to be over so we can meet again for a physical hug and not no, just a I virtual <laughs> <laughs> Any last words? Any last words you well, want to I, share? I, 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 I want to thank you for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I just think that it shouldn't be the last conversation. And, and perhaps at another time also, if we can bring in those, those, those queer narratives, you know, um, so that there is, um, you know, I always say we're talking about I, I, I looking at a fresh fiqh for, for queer Muslims, but you cannot talk about fiqh if you cannot, you know, create a connection between the law and the living, you know? So let's bring the living reality into the room and let those people speak so that that, that can transform our fiqh. So inshallah, let's, let's hope this is not the last conversation. Inshallah, inshallah. And thank you all for attending from the gallery and uh, all of you for listening when you see this online. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Let me just stop the recording.